Well, my name is Lucas Stuber. I'm a speech-language pathologist uh, here with my colleague Narayan from discoveryac.org, which is a new website designed to help parents and professionals worldwide navigate the uh, sometimes complicated world of uh, augmentative and alternative communication. Uh, we're thrilled to be here today with Lauren Enders, uh, who is a full-time augmentative communication consultant and specialist uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, a lot of folks, I think, know Lauren from Pinterest, uh, but also on Facebook, um, you know, Twitter, uh, and as well as, of course, the Practical AAC posts. Um, and, of course, you're a presenter, I think, pretty frequently as well. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, we're thrilled to have you. You're welcome. Um, here. Yeah, good. I wanted to ask you just to start out with, you know, what, what brought you into the field of AAC? Um, what brought me into the field of AAC? Well, that was actually a pretty easy one for me. I did my master's at the University of Pittsburgh and was fortunate enough to have five different practica. Um, so I had a, a typical school, I had a center-based school, I had an inpatient hospital, outpatient hospital, um, and the cleft pa uh, palate craniofacial center of Pittsburgh. Went in thinking I wanted to work with uh, adult stroke patients, neuro, rehab kinds of things, and found that I was a completely different person after working with the kids who needed technology to communicate. Wow. So it was in, you know, in my early training that I discovered that I loved not only that population, but I'm also uh, very techy and just loved learning about the, the technology that was out there and playing with it and that was it. So as soon as I got my first job, I actually requested a caseload with kids who needed assistive tech and AAC. And they easily gave me that. <laughs> yeah. Awesome, awesome. So, so Lauren, uh, a lot of your work has also been around uh, talking about how to integrate AAC into um, everything, right? So, yes. But that's a bit intimidating as well for someone who just starts out, or like because it's a parent or a, or a therapist, it's it's a bit intimidating. So how does one like go about it? How does like uh, how does one start when you say integrate AC into everything? Well, what I try to explain to parents is just that this is your child's voice, so it needs to be available at all times. Um, it needs to be expected at all times that they have something to say. Um, it's it's not going to be something. I also though explain that it's not going to be something that just happens immediately where all of a sudden they can talk in every single situation, they know enough vocabulary. So starting with things, you know, always making sure that you start with things that are very, very highly motivating for that child and kind of beginning there in your heavy focus. Um, and then of course I absolutely pound in as much as possible the need to model whatever system that that child is using. I always say that, you know, the, the biggest single indicator of success or failure is whether that child sees how they are supposed to communicate. We, we can't tell them, just ask them a question verbally, but never demonstrate on their system or a similar system. Um, so it, it's kind of a, what I always explain is that it's about modeling, um, it's about making sure that situations are engaging and that they are, the children are, or adults sometimes, sometimes we end up with um, with folks who have, have gotten beyond that, that stage of being a child but still are not in the, a situation where they really have a good communication system. But it, it's that they need to understand that we have expectations of them, um, that we're not um, speaking for them, jumping in and prompting. So. Um, I don't know that I answered that. It's a, that's a really tough question, um, but it's it's really finding those really engaging moments and starting there, um, and making sure that there is also vocabulary that's actually going to be meaningful to that individual. Um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of problems with the vocabulary that is being selected is only vocabulary that is targeting what we feel are their wants and needs, um, which a lot of times does not really have any connection to quality of life for that individual. Um, what we think is important, like bathroom and different foods, while they are important and they need to be part of what is taught, they're not everything and they are often not what's most motivating for people. You know, they want to, kids want to tell on the kids next to them, tell silly stories and sometimes those things are, or complain, those things are much more motivating and, and really um, a place to start as opposed to making them request something that perhaps they could reach out and get on their own anyway. 
That's a great point. So, uh, so, Lauren, uh, so what would be like, say, when you said about like, how would you go about finding these motivating things? Would you like interview people, talk to people around the kid? So, uh, how would you do like finding out um, motivating stuff? One of the things that I like to do whenever I'm working with um, either a team or a family is I have um, basically a survey that I give out that looks at every part of life. If we we can't really expect someone if we sit down and say what is your kid like or what would they want to talk about they're not going to come up with much because we we can't really wrap our heads around that at any one point in time so what I've done is I've taken um, a really nice survey from Janet's Light which was really geared towards preschoolers and I adapted it a little bit uh, along with my colleague Laurie McGowan and we we made this it's, it's somewhat lengthy it's about 19 pages long but it looks at everything and it asks okay favorite TV shows, favorite things to do, what do you do with your parents? And you know, I always say fill in what you can. If you can't fill that you don't know, just don't stress, just you know, just kind of go by it and go to the next thing, but then being able to look at this survey, it becomes much more apparent kind of what that child likes whether it's foods or activities, you know, what they're into, you know, having it on paper um, and having kind of gone through all these different areas of life, including leisure, which is really important, um, it's not something that we would really think about um, or that parents might think to give us that information without it kind of in that format. So I, I do use a survey, which is I'm on my Pinterest. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, that, you have the sort of concept of the interest inventory, right? Um, really figuring out what a, what's going to motivate a child, what they're really into. And um, I think that sometimes we forget about that also in the school environments particularly because, you know, it's very important for kids to be able to access academics, right? But, um, you know, it's also very important to access uh, these sort of activities of daily living, um, things that kids would want to do. Yep, absolutely. So speaking of which, uh, we're moving into uh, the fall, right? So kids are going to be going back to school. And one thing that you've written a lot about in the past is IEPs and IEPs goals, so individualized education plans. So mm -hmm. I'm curious, um, you know, they, it, this is too big of a conversation to have the entire thing now. IEP goals is a, a really big topic. Um, but what are a couple top tips that you might have for uh, professionals that are writing IEP goals? Okay. Um, well, I actually wrote, a, if you see me, my eyes going to the left, I actually wanted to make sure that I made a couple points. So I have on my screen, I have a couple things I wanted to touch upon. Um, that one of the biggest problems that, that I see with, IEP goals um, is not even specific to AAC is that we tend to get these goals that are completely not measurable you know it used to be that we could write a goal and just say so and so will improve so and so you know so and this this skill which had there was really no basis there was there's no way of measuring it um, so one of the biggest issues is just a general IEP issue is making sure that whatever goal is written is written in a way that it can actually be measured um, and we can determine whether this child is making progress toward that goal or whether it need, needs to be a revision and it needs to be modified. So that's one of the things and that, that's, I think that's still pretty rampant out there is, is people maybe not having um, the right training or the right skills to write a goal that's measurable. Um, another thing is that even if it is a measurable goal, um, it's really essential that that goal be clearly enough written with enough detail that somebody who picks up that goal either later in the year if the child moves, changes placement, um, the next year, um, that they can pick that up and know exactly what they were talking about. So I think it's a really good thing to take your IEP goals, write your draft goals, and hand it to another professional or anybody who might be implementing that goal and say, does this make sense to you? What do you get from that? Um, because what we think sounds really great in our head and sounds measurable and sounds followable, if that was a word, I'm not sure it is, but I'm going to make it one, <laughs> um, I think is not always really the case. So I think we have to be really cautious and make sure that there is enough detail in that goal um, that it actually can be followed by whoever picks up that people have a clue of what, what you intended by that goal. Um, again, so something not really specific to AAC, more of an issue with just IEP goals in general. Um, a third thing is making sure that we are targeting goals 
that are actually functional for that student. Not nothing. Yeah, it would be nice. It would be nice for the child to to be able to do this particular skill, but is that really? If, if we're looking at a child, we're looking at a child with complex communication needs that, that needs to be able to do a whole lot that perhaps is challenging right now. You know, are we targeting something that is really crucial to their functioning? You know, is it something kind of on the fringe that that we're just picking? Um, so I think we have to be careful that it's really going to make a difference in this child's world and that it is achievable within the time frame of the IEP. You know, you see sometimes these kind of big goals that really it's unlikely for them to be met and then we have a family who feels uh, frustrated because this, this goal was written and they keep feeling that there's been no progress made. I think we have to be careful that the goals are achievable. Um, and then the, the final thing about IEPs and AAC is really more AAC related so now we're on to AAC is that and it's something that I remember hearing from Gail Van Tatenhove years ago in a workshop with her then what she said was AAC therapy is just language therapy you know people see oh I got this kid with it with that needs augmentative communication oh my gosh how do I write a goal it's the same as writing a goal for anybody else what are the language skills that that child needs right now to be able to move forward. Um, so is it being able to, you know, provide uh, a verb and an adjective, you know, looking, basically looking at language development, how it should be occurring naturally, and applying that to this child who's using some form of augmentative communication. You know, really trying to take some of the complexity out of it and saying, look, this is just language therapy. You know, what skill are we trying to provide? And then, of course, your, special, your specially designed instruction is going to be a little different because you're using other tools. So there, there's going to be things related to whether it's technology or whether it's a paper system. There's going to be additional things in your, in your SDI or perhaps in your, in your description of the, the goal. Um, but really making sure folks understand this is just language therapy. That's great. That's a really good point. That's a great point, Lauren, because uh, effectively, the, out of the three points that you mentioned, uh, I think only the last one is kind of partly specific to AAC. Uh, the, the first two are, are a little more like something that even anyone follows as like, oh, if you write a document, you get it reviewed by someone. If you write software, you get it reviewed from someone. Uh, that's like a very, like a hygiene sort of a thing. And the second part is like, it's like setting expectations in some sense, right? Like, it's very interesting that it's not AAC specific. Like, uh, if it's going to be a challenge, it's not, oh, it's not because it's AAC. It's because, like, we're not doing certain simple things. If we get do certain simple things right, it will make a whole lot of a difference. Right. Yeah, but that last one is, you know, it really throws people for a loop because, you know, when many people, unfortunately, even at this stage, will if they're lucky get one course in augmentative communication in their in their training whether it's whether even if they're speech therapists many people will just get one AAC course and typically that AAC course is really a lot of showing what the technology and the types of AAC are it really is almost never about implementation there's maybe a couple programs out there that, that do a good job of that and I'm not saying that doesn't exist but you know by and large I think that it's still an area that we're just not being trained in not only SLPs but then we look at teachers and and you know and paraprofessionals who just don't have the knowledge so when you know we're looking at a teacher and an SLP who all of a sudden are asked to write an IEP goal for a child with complex communication needs um, they think oh well you know I, I, don't, I don't know this I, I, I didn't learn this you know so I think it's really important to quickly to say you can do this this is just this is just about a child learning language. This child is just using some other methods to get at providing language. So it's you know making sure that there are um, some guidelines on what to be expected you know in language development, just general language development kinds of things. Well, first we do this, then we do that, then we do that. This is what's important, and trying to kind of quell some of those fears and saying this is what you do with your other kids. We've just got some some other tools thrown in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a fantastic point. Um, that's that's a great point, and I think we have data from the American Speech Language Hearing Association, right, that corroborates that a lot of SLPs. It's a very small, you know, minority that 
that feel comfortable with AAC. So that that could go a long way. I've also had speech uh, language pathologists tell me that they think it's a professional liability to admit that they don't know anything because the expectation is that they would. Um, so I mean, obviously, this is a big part of why we wanted to start Discover AAC, right? Is to provide yeah. a lot more. That's one of the reasons why I'm here. I'm I'm anxious to to be involved because I think it's something that that really needs to be out there. That the resources people do, you know, we, we do run into some people who don't want to learn, and that's personalities. And um, but I think by and large, people do want to know and want to you know want to fulfill the the mission statement of being a, a speech language pathologist. They want to make sure that somebody can communicate. It's just there's fear involved because they don't really know where to go. Right. What to do. I, if I could go back for one second, you know, you talked a lot, very well about uh, setting realistic goals. You know, and I sometimes people can struggle with having to write a realistic goal, but also having to balance the expectations of parents, right, which might be higher, as well as our sort of ethical need to presume competence, right, that we uh, right. sort of assume kids can get to a higher level than they are now. Do you have any tips or strategies in that regard? Um, well, I tend to do when I'm um, either at an IEP or at, we're facilitating a set meeting and we're looking, of course, set meetings, we're not really developing goals, but we're talking, but we do talk about the tasks that we want that student to do, which kind of can translate to goals once we get to an IEP. Um, and one of the things that I try to do is um, try to, to lighten the mood a little bit is, is what I'll say is, well, um, you know, imagine that coming in is the AAC genie, um, but I can only grant wishes that can occur either in the next six months or the next year. So any, you know, any kind of large overarching statements about, you know, well, I want my child to talk intelligibly or I want, those are great things and those are things to, to look forward to, but that's not what we're focusing on here. We're focusing on things that the AAC genie could, could potentially, you know, with the right supports could make come true in six months or a year. Um, so you know, think smaller. Think of where that where your child is right now, and think of those. You know, if you could have one or two things, you know, tomorrow night at dinner, and you could have one or two things that, that your child could say effectively, could communicate effectively. You know, what are those kinds of things? So I, I try to um, kind of pull people back a little bit. Say, look, you know, your overarching goals are great, um, but when we're writing an IEP goal or when we're looking at the tasks within a set process, we really need to kind of pare down and focus on something that's achievable in the short term. Um, and then, the, you know, we can keep hoping and moving towards those long-term goals. But, you know, to be able to focus, um, I try to kind of give, almost give time frames. Great. Sometimes it seems to help. No, that's great. So thinking about the opposite perspective then, is there anything that you would want to say to parents as far as what are their, what, what should their expectations be walking in an IEP meeting? Is there anything they should be critical of or ready to sort of investigate in greater detail? Um, well, in terms of, of parents really thinking about them being prepared when they're walking into an IEP meeting, and we have parents, of course, we have parents who are neophytes to the process and really know nothing. Um, we have parents who now have kids who maybe are in secondary school and they've gone through this process a lot. Um, when I was thinking about that question, um, it was really, I think that parents do need to, to whatever their ability level is, and, and parents have different levels of support and savvy, and you know, but if possible, to try to, um, for, for teams to give them access to us like discovery practical AC that can give you a little bit of information but you know, it can be overwhelming. So when we are providing families with these kinds of things, and that's why Discovery AC is, is nice because it's you know small targeted um, pieces of information that are that are provided in, in different methods, whether it's video, reading, whatever, whatever works for that person. Um, practical AC is also excellent because they're usually nice little short segments, you know, top ten, top five because um, families can really get overwhelmed. But I think we do need to encourage them to, um, to really look into this and prepare and, and do some, some uh, preparation before an IEP meeting. Not, not to stress them out, but to, to make them feel empowered. Like, you can do this. Here's some, here's some tools you can do this with. Um, another thing, uh, and this is something that I've seen from the phenomenal Erin Sheldon, whose daughter Maggie um, is an AAC user, 
um, and has uh, Angelman syndrome. And Erin is is absolutely genius in what she does with Maggie and um, just everything from from supporting her friendships to communication to every you know everything that she does. Um, and one of the things that she does with Maggie every year is that she creates um, kind of a one-page sheet about her daughter. And I would really encourage parents to do that. You know, the, this is what my daughter likes. This is what she can do at home. This is what she doesn't like. You know, kind of the, really giving that parent an opportunity to say, you know, this is what I see my child being able to do. This is what I see as my biggest concerns about their communication. And really, whether it, you know, maybe it's us actually giving them, not everybody's going to be like Erin and, and have this beautifully constructed, one-page, you know, visual treat with all this spectacular information. Not everybody's in the position to do that. But what if we created kind of um, almost like a, a template of sorts where parents could even fill that in by hand? Um, and they can stick on a picture, you know, having something that could be handed to a parent and saying, no, this is for input. You know, it's important that we know, you know, what you're seeing at home. Because a lot of times what people are seeing at home is very, very different than what happens at school. Um, so I think that's something else that we could provide to parents. Um, it's not something that I've done, but it's something that I was thinking about and preparing um, to talk today and, and thinking about IEPs and thinking about, um, you know, supporting families. I think that maybe us... Um, or somebody developing a, a template that can then be handed to parents might be helpful. And then it can be shared with the team and then everybody can talk about it. Um, that's awesome. We're, we're totally going to do that. That's, that's a really <laughs> yeah. good idea. That's, that's good a now. pretty good idea. Yeah. And I have seen some parents pretty effectively build, you know, some, some little books or even PowerPoint slides. So that's, uh, that's a really great idea. Especially also to share, I think, with peers, um, you know, in the school so that they know more about uh, their child. Right. I've also been asked to, um, and, and it goes over very, very well. And I don't, you know, I don't know in every situation if there's a person that's kind of in a role. Um, I've been asked to go into the regular ed classroom of a child who has a communication device. Um, there's one child where I've been asked every year. Uh, it was a request of her fa of her mother that I go in to her regular ed class because she's uh, both learning support and she's um, she's included in a regular education class or part of the day and I've been asked to go in and do a presentation about 45 minutes long um, about just complex communication needs and devices and, and, and kid, people who need communication support. Um, it makes a big, I, those kids are riveted for 45 minutes. So, you know, ki they want to learn. That, so if we can also provide those kinds of supports to peers, like you mentioned peers, um, I think those kinds of little presentations just going in, whether it's you know the, the parent or whether it's the AAC consultant, the SLP, um, some going in and you know holding up devices and talking about you know the, you know I'll, I'll mention well, this, you know this child is is your age. Imagine if some if somebody was your age and, and they came in and, and spoke to you were like you were you were five years younger. Sometimes we accidentally do that, you know. So just those kinds of things, you know, the, the really crucial things that peers need to know. That if they only knew they probably would do a beautiful job supporting their peers with complex communication needs. But they need support and training just like anybody else. And it really doesn't. What I found is that 45 minutes just goes a long way, or even a half an hour. Yeah, that's interesting, Lucas. Uh, Lauren, sorry, because uh, what this ties back to the entire um, uh, integration component that we were talking about, right? Because now you're in a classroom where you have these kids around, and you want to tell them, explain to them, hey, this kid's going to be using AC, and the peers are also involved, and the peers are also excited about using it, and that takes the motivation level onto a different uh, uh, plane altogether. Uh, and and uh, I think again, I want to tie it back that these are like very basic things. That, like, this is like communicating the the fact that you'll have a student with who's going to use AAC and communicating that fact to the peers. That's all. That's all it is. It's not like a big science behind it. It's just you nope. tell them that someone's going to be using AAC, and this is what we're going to do about it. And like there are some certain simplified basics that we can do so well. That I think that's something that we should be talking more about. Yeah, the thing when I'm in there is, is I actually do a little bit on aided language simulation, is teaching these kids, you know, one of the best ways for your friend to learn to communicate 
is if you communicate the way that they do. So, you know, they, they always have to ask. It, it can never reach in and touch somebody's device because that's their voice. But if they ask and their friend says it's okay, then that might be one of the most helpful things in getting their friends to communicate. So, you know, I, I even do a little bit with that, and that also makes a difference. I mean, that that's one of the we, – we know, I mentioned earlier, that aided language stimulation or modeling on the system that, that that child is expected to use or adult, whoever is communicating with AAC – um, it is one of the, the biggest indicators of success in, in that person developing strong language skills. Yeah, that's absolutely. And I like you said about being riveted, I've never met uh, a peer that doesn't want to interact with the AAC yeah, device. I mean, I, I always, it's kind of, you know, an ego boost for me because I go in the classroom and I've got, you know, 30 little faces that are <laughs> like stuck, you know, and I, I'm not that interesting, but, you know, it, they, they want to know. They really do. I mean, I, I, yeah, you have to be a little bit engaging, and I can be silly, but, you know, I think it, they they just are really, really wanting to know this stuff, and they, they suck it up, because I'll do little quizzes along the way, and they remember everything I say. So it, it's um, it's something that doesn't take that much time, but but can be pretty helpful. So, Lauren, right. uh, yeah, you, so kind of talking, just taking cue here, uh, you mentioned the integration part here. So what are, like, there are, give us some examples that you've seen of, like, really awesome integrations work. Like, have you seen so some something that other people can look up to and probably say, hey, I can do this. I, I, again, I, I can do some basics, right? And some, some examples of maybe you've seen or implemented uh, successful integrations of AAC. Um, and some of the classes where I've seen some real success, um, there have been screenshots of the ch if, if there is one child with a device, screenshots of that child's main screen. And if typically, you know, I'm I'm a big proponent of core language, so there's um, depending on the student, there, there should be a decent amount of of core on that that main screen, or perhaps it's a combination, of a couple of screens that are actually packing taped to the tables in front of everybody every kid, not just the kids that are using communication devices or communication books, um, and teaching the kids to start um, using aided language to start pointing to words as they speak. And what we find in, in the classrooms, and I've done this in, a preschool, in one pre preschool classroom as well, is that, of course, not shocking, the other kids in these classes are also benefiting. Um, and we're seeing language benefits, you know, their syntax is getting a little better, or their vocabularies are getting a little larger, and the child with the communication system is seeing other people point and use, and, and that's really invaluable. Also having, you know, things up on, you know, if, let's say that, you know, we're focusing on the word go, we'll make, you know, I'll say, okay, we'll go everywhere, put it on the, put it on the, on the smart board, put it on the, the door frame. So every time you go out the door that you point, and it needs to look like their symbol, but you point and you say, okay, we're going to go now. So it, it's really about um, making sure that communication is everywhere, um, but also narrowing it enough to say, you know, don't think this is this massive task. You can focus on, a, just focus on a couple of words a week and try to just model the heck out of those words. You know, th the word go is a great place to start because go can mean start, go can mean walk out of the room and think about how many times you could point to a symbol and model just that one word in a day. So if you focused on that and maybe one other word for a week, um, it, it can really make a, a pretty notable difference. So, you know, the classrooms where I've seen the most success is when there have been communication displays, you know, taped to the tables, on the walls, also, um, you know, kind of cheat sheets about how to interact with people who are, have complex communication needs. I've made a couple. There's other ones that other people have made where they've been printed on, on I'm moving too much, um, where they've been printed on uh, poster paper and kind of put all over the place um, so that the staff in the room is repeatedly reminded of the things, maybe what they shouldn't be doing to support people with complex communication needs and the things that they should be doing so that it's really kind of in their face um, all day long. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a really huge fan of this idea that actually Narayan brought this up recently of the labeled playground. I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to push this forward uh, with all the schools that I work with. Because why not have the, the icon for slide there? We can reinforce language all the time. 
Right. So as soon as, oh, let's go down the slide, you point a slide, I mean, it, it just, the opportunities are there, but we just, we need to have the symbols to be able to, to model it. You know, there's not always, especially on the playground, um, and that's another thing that people get stuck on a little bit, is that, well, in certain instances, if they are using high-tech systems, they can't be having their system. Well, then, then have, it's okay to have a paper model of, of whatever their high-tech system is. You're, you're still reinforcing language and, um, you know, they can still be learning. That's something that, you know, people can get hung up on a little bit. So I try to, try to support that idea also. Just, you know, use, use paper if, if, it's, if it's not a situation where, where the, the electronics are going to work. It's funny how we go back to like low tech <laughs> because something that you know works everywhere. <laughs> so it's it's really interesting that that it that low tech can solve a lot of problems to begin with, and then you can always graduate to high tech and use low tech whenever you want. And, and right. I mean, one of the, the the biggest reasons for high tech is that you know we we do want these large vocabularies, um, and it really becomes unmanageable. To have a huge vocabulary um, when it's not high tech, because then you're 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 flipping too much. Whatever the setup is, it, it's it's just becomes inefficient. And we know that as soon as it becomes inefficient and difficult, we're only going to see um, communication in times where it's it's most motivating, not not at all times. So we we want it to be, you know, communication has to be easy for us to expect it to happen. You know, we don't do stuff that's hard, so neither are they. That's good. Uh, let's see. So, is there anything that you want to share that we forgot to ask about? I don't think so. I think you know one of the you know one of the biggest things is just um, you know making sure that we provide resources that are not overwhelming <laughs> um, to teams and families. I mean, th this is an area where people get overwhelmed pretty easily. So, you know, things like one-page cheat sheets and um, simple little videos that can be watched, um, just making sure that we, we start providing those things. And when we, we do have a great start with, you know, with, with some great blogs and websites, um, but really kind of providing tools that, that make it um, much more palatable and much less scary to um, the folks who are supporting people with complex communication needs. Uh, just curious, uh, Lauren. Why why is it that we say? And I, I've, I know it is overwhelming. Like, but uh, from your experience, why do you think people find it overwhelming? Is it because of the complexity? Is it because of the kid? Uh, because the kid's not communicating anything, so you don't really know what's going on in his or her head. Why is this overwhelming for teachers or parents? I, yeah, I think that one of the, the reasons is because it's it's an unknown. You know, people are uncomfortable when they feel that they don't know what they're doing. And it's just something, you know, most people, unless it's somebody who's, a, you know, a career SLP or teacher who is just constantly working with people with commu complex communication needs, um, most people are not comfortable. So that, that they don't, um, they're just not really kind of sure where to start, what to do, where to go, and I think that fear just kind of jumps in right away. Um, you know, I don't know that I can answer that. That's a that's a that's a big question. Um, but I think a lot of it is is fear. It is just you know uncertainty and fear and, and thinking. You know, I don't know where to start. I don't know what to expect. Um, so I you know again, it's down to you know providing manageable bits of information. Um, and things that are really encouraging, you know, also yeah. making sure that we share successes. I don't think that happens enough, you know, where, you know, I think I always tell teams, if that child says something on the device that you are celebrating during the day then get out your phone or, or take a screenshot and send it home and ha you know, have them ask the child, you know, to, to, you know, try to, either say it again, you know, what did you say, look what you said, you know, so just the same way, you know, when we have kids who are typically developing and they do something really exciting at school that there, that there was a big fuss made about, 
they like to go home and show it and talk about it. And, you know, look what happened. You know, of course, we also have the kids that, what did you do, Dad? Nothing. <laughs> so, you know, we, we have that too. Um, but I think it's important to um, give these kids uh, a voice in not just in, you know, communicating their, their daily needs, uh, you know, beyond wants and needs like we talk about, but just generally daily communication needs, but also kind of just being kids um, and, and being able to share successes. And I, I don't think that happens enough either. So. Yeah. That's, that's, I think that's a great point because um, I think one of the things that um, – I, I, so I follow Dan, Dana Nieder's blog, The Uncommon Sense, and she talks about how, like, even parents shouldn't feel guilty about, oh, I could have started this way before. So she talks a lot about how parents feel. Dean is wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> she's awesome. And and uh, so so it's it's a lot about like also uh, how she writes about keeping uh, like managing expectations and then you know what you can do this you you can do this it's not difficult so but uh, that that's important for us to like kind of uh, bring down the fear bring down the uncertainty and like uh, let parents and professions kind of tread this path with a little less like i think a little more enthusiasm rather than a, yeah. Yeah, and it's definitely great. And that she, her blog is actually one that I tend to share with parents um, who are looking for guidance or information because it's from a parent's perspective, which you know, which is invaluable for the, for these folks. Awesome. Great. Well, we have to ask about the uh, funny story, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, <laughs> this is again coming back to Lauren's point about like how success stories don't get shared. I think a lot of funny stories don't get shared about AAC at all. It's like uh, it's it's not that it's funny. Uh, it's it's just that we, it's very it's a very serious field. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, okay, so my funny people. story. Um, it, it's from a number of years ago. Um, I I worked for years. Um, I don't know, probably more than five years with a little guy who had a pretty significant craniofacial um, anomaly. Um, so he, he liked to be verbal, and he, boy, was he verbal, um, but unfortunately, he was pretty unintelligible. So we were working with him, oh gosh, this was a long time ago, so he had, oh, he might have had a light writer at one point, um, you know, we're talking some old systems that he had, um, I don't remember what he ended up with, but um, it took some prompting to uh, to get this this little guy to actually go to his AAC system because he really wanted to talk. And um, in my first pregnancy with my daughter, um, I was rather large um, and uh, round, and he really wanted to tell me something. Uh, that basically, that he, he had an impression of who I looked like, um, and I kept getting the first part, "You look like a," um, and I could not get the last word. I just could not understand where he was going with it. So finally I you know, got this little guy to um, move to his AAC system and what came out was snowman. So, um, which I thought was <laughs> insanely funny, you know, because I kind of did look like a snowman, you know, and it was like an umpure waisted, you know, little dress, high waisted, so I, I really did look like a snowman. And it was just perfect, but it just, um, I think it highlighted in my mind, uh, you know, and it does over and over again, the fact that, you know, we really need to, just like Dana Nieder talks about, she had a recent blog post about vocabulary and, and making sure we give enough vocabulary to our kids. Um, you know, we have this tendency, and I say we, educators, speech therapists, to really do this focusing on wants and needs and, and you know, seeing these communication displays that are just chock full of nouns, um, you know, only, you know, foods and bathroom and things that w we think are so essential when what was really important to this little guy was to tell me I look like a snowman. So, it, you know, if he didn't have the tools to be able to say that, then, you know, his urge to, to communicate that, that piece of information would have been lost. So I, it's just a fun story that um, kind of reinforces the need to make sure that, that we have more than foods and bathroom and, and toys, favorite toys um, on their systems that we are also teaching, uh, you know, interesting vocabulary, core vocabulary, uh, things like that. Great. 
that's that's a that's a really nice story. Uh, so, so Lucas, uh, do you have anything else to ask? I think I think this has been fantastic. Um, yeah. So thank you so much, uh, Lauren, for speaking with us today. Uh, I I really appreciate it. I look forward to to working together more and um, love your ideas. Yeah, awesome. It was awesome talking to you, Lauren. Again, it's a lot of useful insight. And I think, again, uh, so from for me, it's uh, one of the, one of the biggest takeaways from this is like how like we can do things a little simple. Like we can do a ba basics right, and I think mm -hmm. the, the intimidation and the fear factor kind of can come down if you do certain basic things right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. There's there's a lot we can do. So that's like another reason why again I'm I'm happy to to spend some time working on some some tools and supports with you guys because I think the ideas are are ready and ripe and they need to be put into action. Awesome. All right. Well, All right. this is uh, Lucas and Ryan from discoverac.org signing off with uh, Warren Enders here. And uh, come back on Thursday for our next interview with Carol Zangari. Should be a lot of fun. Woohoo! All right. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Take care, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.